presentation on landfills and hazardous waste. I do not pretend to be an expert on the subject, but I am taking ecotoxicology at the moment. So um, I'm going to do my best. Landfills and hazardous materials. I mean, this is a big subject. I'm going to start off with how much do we put into landfills? And it's a lot. I mean, everybody knows it's a lot. Everyone knows that US is more than most other first world countries, certainly more than developing countries. Uh, we do not have a good culture of reusing and repurposing here. So of the 4.9 pounds per person per day of municipal waste that gets generated, although, you know, you might feel, well, I don't generate that much. That figure actually includes business waste and, and some industrial waste as well. So it averages out at about five pounds a person a day. 21.6% of that is wasted food. 5.83% of that is wasted textiles, and that number is growing. And 12.2% of that is wasted plastics. Okay, so the US is 4% of the world population, but 12% of the municipal solid waste. So normally we would then go and say, well, what about recycling? Recycling can help. Globally, 2.1 billion metric tons of household waste is produced, but only 16% is recycled. However, you know, one of the things about recycling is it helps save natural resources, it helps save energy, but it's not always energy efficient to recycle. It depends, especially with plastics, it depends on what kind of plastic it is. Plastics recycling rates at under 10%. And most of the country can't recycle anything above the triangle with the number one and the number two in it with the different types of resins. So in theory, you can recycle plastics one through seven, but for most of the country, that isn't true. And for most of the country, the only plastic that is effectively recycled and reused is uh, plastic bottles, which are number ones. So your to-go food containers, and uh, your plastic shopping bags, they actually just clog up the recycling facilities a lot of the time and they do not get recycled. So there's this phenomenon called wish cycling. This was this thing where, you know, you buy something like a to-go food and you take their container and you think, well, I'm going to wash this out and I'm going to throw it in the recycling bin. And therefore I am not contributing to waste. I am not being wasteful. But unfortunately, a lot of that will not get recycled. The EPA also wants people to, to think more about reducing their waste rather than just recycling it, because recycling it is kind of like a Band-Aid, whereas really we got to get into a more of a reuse and a kind of culture and with less throwing away. So zero waste can be very difficult, but we could get somewhere in between where we are now and zero waste. So thinking about how you store things, uh, how much you buy, whether you actually need all of it, whether you actually need the product at all as well. Okay, so landfills are regulated by federal, state and tribal regulations. And there are some quite strict federal regulations, which every state in the US has to follow. There is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, otherwise known as the RCRA. Subtitle D deals with solid waste and subtitle C deals with hazardous waste. And then there's also the Toxic Substances Control Act, which deals with toxic waste. Uh, stringent design and operation requirements are needed and they should be followed in theory. I mean, obviously there's always a problem there. So you can get under subtitle D, you get municipal solid waste landfills, and then you get other landfills which are under that title, but they're more specialized. So they take organic matter and they compost it down quickly and they create methane, which is then trapped off. And these are called bioreactor landfills. And then separate to that as well, there are industrial waste landfills. And then there's also construction and demolition debris landfill. So I think that's self-explanatory. And then under subsite title D, there is the hazardous waste landfills. 
And a subcategory of that would be the polychlorinated biphenols, such as the PCB landfills. And very often with these landfills, pretreatment is required, as well as specialist dumping. So in Texas, most of the garbage collection and landfill sites are owned by private companies. They do have uh, strict licensing agreements. They have to be responsible for the sites for many years and after they're closed. Um, there are regulations that they need to follow. But of course, as with everything, there is a lobby at the state level wanting to reduce the number amount of paperwork created for these landfill sites. They say it's too onerous on the business owners. But from what I understand, business owners are doing very well out of this. So if you look at the numbers here, the most landfill sites is actually in California. And they have more than twice the number of any other state except for Texas. The actual operational sites at the moment, there's 26 in Texas and 55 in California. And then the numbers in green are proposed landfill sites. Okay, so how do landfills work? Well, there are some things which are modern landfills are needed. So in the old landfills, problems were buildup of methane gas, which then escaped into the atmosphere, leachate, which was rainwater pouring down through all the waste materials and the decomposing materials, and then all the toxins from there will go into groundwater underneath. So a modern Waste um, landfill site requires a good plastic layer surrounding the entire pit, a leachate collection system, which will then pump the leachate that comes out and take it to be treated and never let it get into the groundwater. And then and also a gas collection system for collecting methane which then takes it up and it gets used into or is used for power. So very often the methane doesn't necessarily get added to the national grid, but it's used by the landfill itself for its own power uses. I'm going to show you a small video about how a landfill site works. One thing they do not show is that each day after the waste has been put into the site, it's supposed to be covered by a layer of soil or other inert material, which will stop the smells from reaching out, from getting out of the site. And each day they do that. Each time they dump something, they cover that cell with soil or um, maybe old building materials or something else which is inert and that which will protect that particular area of refuse. I was just curious, you know how you had like, there was like 20 something sites in, in Texas that are landfills, but there was like 50, some that were proposed. Are those sites going to actually be developed? Are they definitely going to become landfills? And, and what's the time frame in that? I do not know the answer of that question. But yes, some of them at least will be because a lot of the landfills that are in operation at the moment are reaching being full, so you have to create another landfill to put the waste. Okay. We all know rotting garbage is stinky, and it's even worse when it gets wet. So you can bet the stink is sickening when it rains on a 100-foot-tall mound of rotting garbage. Of course, that happens a lot at landfills here in southeast Louisiana. When it rains at any landfill, water seeps down through the grass and earth through the garbage heap and collects on the bottom. So do liquids that ooze out of the garbage when it decomposes. All that liquid is called leachate. As the garbage decomposes, it emits gases like methane and CO2. A layer of gas forms on top of the leachate. Landfills have a system to collect both the leachate and the gas so they don't contaminate the environment. Pumps send the leachate to retention ponds where it's treated and stored. There are also vertical gas wells running down through the landfill. They use vacuums to collect the gas. Different pumps inside those wells send the gas up and out to a gas plant, where it can be processed and sold as usable natural gas. Now, if these pumps are working properly, there should be only one foot of leachate under that 100-foot mound of garbage. The vacuums that suck the gas into the wells sit right above that normal leachate level. But if the pumps are not working like they weren't at Jefferson Parish landfill for years, the mound of garbage becomes flooded with leachate. 
That flood of leachate can block the vacuums from sucking the gas into the wells. And now that layer of toxic smelly methane and hydrogen sulfide isn't being collected anymore. Instead, it rises up through the landfill and escapes into the air. I thought that was quite informative. It's only two minutes, but um, they often explain things better than I do, these little videos. Okay, so when we talk about hazardous waste, we're usually talking about industrial hazardous waste, which is a toxic ash or sludge, uh, and then household um, hazardous waste. So there are various types toxic, like cleaning fluids, rat poison, pesticides, corrosive, battery acids, drain cleaners, oven cleaners, reactive, pool chemicals, ammonia, bleach, and flammable, gasoline, barbecue starter, and solvents. There's other kinds of household waste, asbestos-laden insulation, uh, paint, old car batteries, antifreeze, used oil, fluorescent lights, and I'm sure the list is not comprehensive. So improper disposal of hazardous waste would be to pour it down the drain, pour it on the ground, pour it down the storm drain, put it out with your regular trash. If you visit any municipal website they, and you ask the question, how do I discard my hazardous waste? The EPA would like everyone to recycle everything that they can. So oil and petroleum can be re-refined and reused. Batteries can be recycled, or certainly the chemicals within them can be recycled. And if you actually go to this link, so this is on the EPA website as well, and it tells you what it would like, you know, and so alkaline and zinc carbon. So the EPA recommendation is send them to battery recyclers. I cannot find a battery recycler in my area. So the, all I know is I'm going to have to take it to either a drop off site or a pickup collection process, you know, when they have an event button cell or coin batteries. I don't think these ones, and, and the lithium single use batteries. It says, look for a recycling location near you. Well, I have, as I said, any kind of battery, I have not found a recycling location. Then, you know, nickel cadmium batteries, lithium iron batteries, nickel metal hydrate batteries. All of these types of batteries, there's different ways to recycle them. You're supposed to find a recycling location near you. Well, good luck with that. And automotive batteries as well. Now I have been able to dispose of an automotive battery at a waste collection event, but they wouldn't take any of my alkaline batteries. So that makes life very difficult. So it, it's, it's probably a good idea to think of using reusable batteries, which you can get more life out, rechargeable batteries. But then again, the, you're really going to have to take them to a site which will accept them and then dispose of them properly if they cannot be recycled. Some other things like pharmaceutical waste, it needs to be incinerated, but it can't be incinerated in any kind of incinerator. It needs to be a medical waste incinerator with special filters on it to make sure that you don't get toxic fumes going out into the atmosphere. You know, a lot of these things really need careful consideration. Certainly never ever flush old pharmaceuticals down the toilet. As you can see with hazardous waste, if you do need to get rid of it, it needs to be in sealed containers. It needs to be in a very well lined pit and it you know, just in case there's any leaks, leachate needs to be taken care of and it needs to be monitored. Again, a permeable cap on the top so rain can't get in there. And, um, you know, it, it needs to be looked after in perpetuity, basically, to make sure there's no have any problems. So how do we dispose of hazardous waste from our homes? Well, like I said, drop off facilities and collection events organized by your local municipality. It needs to be in the original container. It needs to be closed. It needs to be not leaking. It needs to have the labels are readable. And unfortunately, I looked around. There was absolutely no advice of what you would do if you found substances, you know, doing a garage cleanup or whatever, which did not have readable labels, or like paint tents, which you know the lids don't close properly, or you know they've 
you know, if they don't follow that advice, I think the only thing you can do is probably wrap them up in a plastic bag, put on it your best guess of what it is, and take it along that way. We store in our transport upright, and the most thing was uh, don't mix them. Okay, I've got another video here. Lending a hand. Hi there, I'm Ashley. Hi. What's your name? Bobby Baker. Nice to meet you, Bobby. So the Household Hazardous Waste Facility, what exactly do y'all do here? Uh, we process people's household hazardous waste. Um, antifreeze, oil, batteries, fluorescent bulbs, pesticides. People in Texas have antifreeze and it doesn't really get Believe it or not. Okay. Really? Okay, so batteries, oil, yeah, all that stuff you don't want hanging around the house. That's right. We want to keep that stuff out of the landfills, ultimately out of the water supply. For sure, out of the Colorado River. Uh, and all the little creeks and all the other little water things. Good. Um, I am ready to get my hands dirty. I'm going to roll my sleeves up and jump in and help you. Let's do this. All right, cool. Um, did you want to get paint all over your vest? No. I don't. Do you have Do you have something I can change into? I think so. Let's go look. <laughs> All right, thanks. Look who came totally unprepared for her first day on the job. This gal. Good thing I changed quickly. All right, Bobby. I'm ready. Let's do this. Way more comfortable, too, actually. Yeah, well, you look like a natural. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so what are we going to be doing? Well, we're going to open paint and determine if it's good or bad. And so I need to put it. my hair up because I really up. don't want to get that. I have a feeling I'm about to get really dirty. It's yellow though. Yeah, the blonde. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to be doing? Since these are already open, we're going to go ahead and pour them. So I'm going to let you pour paint. Let me pour paint. Where do we pour it? All right, you're going to on... pour it into this drum. Okay. We'll go ahead and pour it right on top of this tea. And then... Okay. And I just plop it onto this thing right here? Plop it on and go ahead and give it a couple Ew. of turns. It's <laughs> lime green. It looks like the slime on that. <laughs> okay, turn it like this. Mm -hmm. All right. And then what? And that looks good. Well, that's easy enough. Yep, now you only have to do it 100 more times. <laughs> there you go. See, something like that. What is would, this? Now, that would be bad paint. That's bad paint? That's it bad smells paint. really gross. <laughs> So that one would go into this, into the trash. Cool. <laughs> into the trash? You just go ahead and dump it in. Whoa. Yeah, that's really bad paint. With some sewage water or something mixed in. Whew. I bet you get lightheaded doing this. <laughs> Try to reuse all the good stuff. Okay, what about this one? That looks kind of sketchy. Yeah, it's got know, like a watery. Yeah, that's that's what we call the slime, but that's fine. Let's go it's ahead. It's still good paint. We are gonna use and because it. it's dark, it goes in this. That's way. right. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> wow, that had all kinds of colors in it. it must have been a kid's bedroom. So yep. how long have you been doing this? Uh, two years. Two years. Do you love it? Oh, absolutely. Oh. Uh, being what? able to uh, do good for the environment to walk away from the job at the end of the day feeling pretty good. So because it's metal, we put it over here. Wow, that's really gross. <laughs> See, that was a trick one. It came out dark in the end. Oh, yeah. Well, that happens. That's why it comes out off-white. Okay. <laughs> We're going to call that good paint. Yeah. Do y'all ever have races? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd get really competitive. Now, this is metal, so it goes in here? Yes, ma'am. See, I got this. Production might slow down greatly, but I got this. <laughs> it's getting full. Yeah, it sure is. It's a good thing we're filling these barrels at a record speed. Last year, this program alone reblended 16,260 gallons of paint. So far, I've helped empty about 10 gallons of paint. That means I have 16,250 gallons to go. With all this work, I'm starting to get really hungry. Pepper, pepper, What's in it? Uh-uh. Man, I really like pickles, too. <laughs> uh, scratch that, folks. I just lost my appetite. Yeah. We'll go ahead and close this up and deal with this one accordingly. We'll just go ahead and put this you in the fridge. You get all kinds of stuff here, don't you? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep this for our potlucks. Keep that for the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once everything is poured into the drums, then what do you do with it? Then we make some reblend. Okay, let's go do that. Well, let's go do that. I'll let the professionals get back to doing what they do here. Oh, we did just fine. <laughs> okay, we've 
We poured the paint, the good paint, not the stinky, smelly stuff, into the drums, and then what are we gonna do now? This is our reblend. We are gonna put these in that big mixer over there. Okay. So before we do that, we're gonna have to put some PPE on. What does PPE stand for? You're scaring Personal me. Personal protective equipment. Okay, that makes sense. Safety, I'm sure, has to be a big thing out here. Absolutely. Uh, what we do is 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 dangerous, so we need to protect ourselves. It's hazardous. It says it on the front of the building. Yes. I saw that. Okay. Absolutely. Very good. Okay, so what do we have to put on? We need to put a hard hat on and a high vis vest. Okay. High visibility. I have a hard head already, but we'll definitely put a head on. <laughs> Let's do it. Get our PPE on. Okay, how's my hair? Oh, I need to put it up. I don't want to get paint in my hair. You know, if I had hair, I would get painted. <laughs> okay, I would say that nobody is going to miss us in these bright yellow sexy vests. High vis. High vis, sorry. Sorry, is that the official term? That's what we call it around here. Okay, gloves on. Let's go re-blend some paint. Let's do it. Ah. Is there a class clown of the group? Um, probably me or this guy here. <laughs> and you two are the ones running this. I know, it's frightening, equipment. frightening. I'm See, really there you glad go. you had there me change out of my vest. <laughs> Watch your hair. <laughs> You're good. Yeah, how do you get paint out of hair? <laughs> fumes though, seriously, fumes. <laughs> You're getting to me. I've been out here too long. Yeah, you know, you would really hate some of the other paint. The oil-based paint really stinks. Take her away, Joe. Time to mix. What do I Drop do? Drop the mixer. Drop Go ahead. the mixer. <laughs> Nothing happens. <laughs> Let it go. Well, that sure isn't speedy, is it? I am so excited to see this color. Like I said, it's like a big milkshake or cake batter. Like okay, cake batter. Yeah, I like milkshakes better. I don't. How long do we blend the paint for? About 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so what's next? I need you to crank it on. Crank it on, it's time. Push the button. Start. <laughs> dumping four 40 gallon containers into this giant mixing contraption, letting it blend until the paint is fully mixed, forming a new color. Bobby told me it's similar to mixing a cake. You want all the ingredients to be blended thoroughly. It's probably good I'm not in charge of monitoring the batch. Baking and cooking are just not my forte, y'all. It's time to stop this mixing contraption and see what crazy color we've created. Okay, so what color is this? Uh, we are mixing today the Balcones Canyon Land. It's our darker color. Very good, and it is. It's kind of like a, a light gray or dark brown. Yeah, depending on what came in that day, it's, it's it could be either one of those. What else do you have? We also do a lighter color, which is like an off-white, light beige, and it's called Texas Limestone. Now we're going to pump the water through here? That's right. Oh, that's not light. Well, let's go pour some paint. Let's go pour some paint. I will turn this on real quick. Okay. We'll pour a couple buckets, then we slide them down, and then we gotta put we gotta put a put lid, lid on, on them. That's right. Put a lid on it. Put a lid okay. on it. I am on the job. If I don't get fired. There's a little bit extra on the side for you. <laughs> there you there, go. That perfect. Good? That was perfect. A perfect pour. Oh, I'd hate to spill this. This really smells bad. All 
right now we're cooking. You haven't, you haven't worked here unless you spilled something all over the floor. And yeah. Everybody rides <laughs> yeah. you about it. Oops. <laughs> Don't Oopsie. worry about it. Nothing to see here. Slide it down. Come on. There you go. I'm Ashley Camrath. I'm on the job. Bobby, thanks for all your help. There's the last one. Yeah. This job has dripped all kinds of fun on me and my clothes. If you'd like to get some of the paint that actually made it into these buckets or drop off hazardous materials, stop by the Household Hazardous Waste Facility at 2514 Business Center Drive. I thought that was pretty interesting. It was in Austin. It would be interesting to know whether other cities have similar programs. I guess it's paint you buy when you don't really mind what color it ends up. Okay, so Kathy's already talked a lot about Superfund sites. So I'm really not going to cover that again. But I did want to give a few examples. Kathy talked about the San Jacinto River waste pits. So basically, it can be any kind of material polluting the area. I mean, anything from heavy metals to chemicals to petroleum products. There's no one thing that can pollute a particular area. It can be several different things or lots of different things, but they all fall, fall under the same rules for cleaning up. The San Jacinto River waste pits was used for the disposal of paper mill sludge. And as Kathy mentioned, the river has eroded into the waste pits. And this is a problem because the such contained chlorinated dioxins, which were used to bleach the paper. And this is very toxic for aquatic life. Even after some remediation, they're still flooding into the river. The river is still being polluted by it. The Sykes disposal pits, it's also near the I-10. And it was an illegal dumping site with mostly chemical wastes like benzene, phenols, and organic solvents. And it was most likely from petrochemical companies in the area, just illegally dumping waste. Apparently, they just tossed things out and down into the ditches, into the fields. It wasn't even done in an orderly way. Federated Metals was used as a disposal site for magnesium, dross, and sludge, asbestos, contaminated concrete, gasket copper rings, breakout material from electric chlorine cells. It was actually quite an extensive list. So this was a company that actually took materials in saying that they were going to dispose of them safely, but they didn't. And then Patrick Bayou is another one here in Houston. It has contaminated sediments, which include PAHs, pesticides, metals, and biphenols. So the sediment has contaminated the adjacent wetlands. This is a threat to downstream fisheries. And this wasn't all illegal. Some of it was accidental and some of it was legal discharge from the petrochemical companies in the area. So even that has managed to contaminate areas. It's before people knew better, but even now it is still happening. I wanted to brush on the topic of social unfairness or environmental justice, if you will, because the burden of dealing with the effects of pollution has fallen on the majority on non-white and low-income communities. They lack the resources to be a NIMBY community or a not in my backyard community. These communities are often very, um, I said low income, they're often food deserts as well. They lack educational resources. And because people don't have the ability to make their voices heard, Sometimes they suffer terrible effects from having either unmonitored waste sites in their area polluting groundwater or even hazardous waste sites. Because even though the rules are now that you have to have a lining around your waste site, that doesn't mean that they went back and put a lining around all the old landfills. So there are still problems with pre-existing landfills that have been closed off, but they've never been properly looked after, and they are still leaching chemicals into groundwater and into the soil. And this actually is a global issue. Greenlife coined the term toxic colonialism or waste colonialism. So in the 80s, when the waste regulator was starting to become more regulated, obviously the costs went up. At the time, it was cheap to transport things around the globe. 
it was common already for people to sell ships under a flag of convenience, which is basically they have the business registered in a country that they do not actually operate from. It's often done for tax reasons, but it's also to get around environmental legislation. And then you get the less scrupulous of, um, operators who basically just want to get rid of stuff as cheaply as possible. And so there's some examples of things that happened back in the 80s. Is, um, there was a British company called Thor Chemicals, and they transported mercury waste to South Africa. It was actually deposited in the ground near what used to be called a homeland under apartheid. But basically, it was where African people lived rather than white people lived. And it was incinerated there and, the, you know, the, the incinerations was just dumped in the ground. So, you know, who knows what happened to that community in Nigeria. This was actually prevented, but they found that there was an Italian company or a couple of Italian companies that were going to store 18,000 barrels of leaking toxic waste that included polychloride biphenols. And they were going to store them there and they were going to pay the community $100 a month which is appalling. So there has been um, some progress on that. The map I've put in there is hazardous waste generation. And basically, no surprise, well, Russia seems to be the highest in waste generation, and then closely followed by the US and some other small countries here. Most of the waste is generated by the first world, and in times past, it was moved to somewhere, a developing country in the third world, and they weren't told how to deal with it. There wasn't open communication. And, you know, these two examples I gave are just two of a long list of scandals that basically happened. Quick question. Yes. I'm actually surprised that China is listed below Russia and the United States we have 100 percent and India is like looking like it's pretty green. I know that's more like developing, but like, do we know for a fact that Russia, that China is this, that we have enough information on that, like to determine China, not not be as responsible, as bad as we are? OK, this is from a website called ResearchGate. Remember, hazardous waste isn't just toxic, you know, it's household waste and it's also manufacturing waste. And China has a lot of manufacturing and a lot of unregulated manufacturing. So in the US, there is, are some regulations in place. So the generation of toxic waste is at least controlled somewhat by legislation. I don't think that's the case in China. I think that's what accounts for it. I also think about the majority of the people in China are the, in that less developed kind of world. So they're not buying the products for that either. Even though they're glo globally trading, we look at the population and how they're not using stuff either. Yes. I'm surprised. It's just, it just seems like that. Yes. No, it is surprising. You know, I had to do a double take when I looked at this. I thought the U.S. would be bright red along with China, but it isn't. It's actually in the orange. No, no, no. But yellow, orange is worse than yellow, right? Am I reading that right? So right. So China, no, China. Is, China no, this is, is better. Russia. This is Russia here. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. The worst is Russia, which I wouldn't think they would report much either. And I would think that it would have been like China and Russia and then maybe the United States. And I'm surprised Brazil is also up there. It's just because I guess I guess the, I understand the Gulf, the, the petroleum making states and why they would have a higher. Yeah. I don't know well, coal mining and other kinds of mining are huge industries in, in Russia. And there is a lot of um, toxic waste um, associated with those industries. And then, of course, in the Amazon basin, there are people taking advantage up there there's a lot of rain forest reduction felling and so a lot of the waste is going into the amazon river rather than being controlled properly so i think that probably accounts for for that but yes it is it's surprising it's surprising that europe looks so good as well but i think some of the highest controls in the world are in europe regulations i should say so developing countries dumping waste on undeveloped countries without providing information on hazards or how to manage them became a global issue and one that was actually the Basel Convention was started to try and address. So they did. They started off by saying that hazardous wastes had to be 
it, compliance, they had to follow PIC compliance, which is prior informed consent. And basically where they were, they were going, they had to have notification that they were going to send the waste. The receiving nation had to give consent and issue paperwork, and then they would be transported. And then the place where it was being sent to would have to provide a receipt that they had received it. So this is a way to try and prevent dumping at sea as well. But there were still people who felt that, you know, there were still first world countries taking advantage of third world countries. And whether it was, they sometimes called it the Northern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere movement of waste. It's not obviously not that simple. But the ban amendment was introduced and was adopted in 1994. And it needed 25 countries to ratify. So it's actually only 2019 that it was ratified. And that prohibits developed countries from exporting hazardous waste to developing countries. So developing countries can um, export hazardous waste to each other. And developed countries can export hazardous waste to each other, but they cannot do it in between. So this is going to be a good step, I think. The Basel Convention was also the first set of global rules on plastic litter. Because it's an international problem, getting countries to agree on international standards is a difficult thing. So this is a good development. And so what about the future? What about upcoming issues? Well, electronic waste or e-waste is becoming a bigger and bigger problem and not just in developed countries. Undeveloped countries are developing in piles of unwanted cell phones and unwanted laptops as well. So basically electronic waste is anything with a plug. And it'll be interesting to see whether we can preempt some of the problems by putting legislation in place before it becomes a toxic disaster. Another issue which is increasing is the disposal of unwanted clothing. There are now movements, of course, in the UK and the US to get rid of what they call fast fashion. So these are, you know, they do create jobs in the third world, but these are clothes which are made with cheap materials that are sewn using labor that is more than likely to be taken advantage of. And you know, it basically gets worn a couple of times before it gets given away to a Goodwill shop or whatever. And apparently unwanted clothing has become a bigger and bigger percentage of the waste that's been thrown away. And people in the third world countries don't want it either. Lithium and cobalt from phone batteries. Older wind turbines will need to be recycled at some point. So the question is, a lot of what we have done so far to legislate for waste disposal has been in reaction to problems that um, have been seen or, you know, they could have been predicted, but they weren't. And basically, it took some scandals for countries to change their laws and make it more regulated. So the question is, can we anticipate the future problems and put regulation in place before it becomes an issue of hazardous waste endangering the environment or humans living in the area? Can I ask a quick question about? Yes. For the Basel Convention and the Ban Amendment, it says like you're talking about hazardous waste. Does e-waste not fall under hazardous waste? Okay. Um, at the moment, they put waste as the reason I ask is because I know that that we ship our electronic waste to third world countries and then they burn that, which then becomes an air pollutant, and then also yes. gets into the waterways, but then they pull the precious metals out of it. So I was wondering if we're not. Does that does that 2019 amendment or whatever ratify that? So as things stands, I don't think we're allowed to dump e-waste. Yes, it would be hazardous waste onto other countries because of the PIC consent. But we have often sent phones over saying that we're donating them and they don't need them and they can't get them to work and they're out of date and it's it's it is terrible. They have annexes where they treat incinerator ash, plastics, and household waste separately to other types of waste. And the rules are slightly different for that. But yes, hopefully with the ban amendment, it will stop 
developed countries sending their old electronic waste to third world countries. They really should be set up. But who like checks, I guess, who's the regulator, like the the ports of entry? And then if they pay enough money to someone in a third world country undercover, like... Basically, any covers the countries that signed up to the treaty. Oh. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, been ratified by 25 countries. So if the country hasn't signed up to it, then they're not bound by that treaty. And who would find them anyway? Like, who's the yes. arbiter or the fine? And yes, the yes. So, I mean, it basically, it's just a matter of trying to come up with regulations and way of, because that's the other thing, who enforces the regulations. And people are always looking for loopholes for the regulations. So I don't think this is the end of the problem by any means. It's going to be an ongoing issue. But, you know, with a growing population, it's an ongoing issue of greater importance than maybe it was, you know, when we had major pollution in rivers or, you know, it it's really has become part of our global problem. And the EPA would say, well, you should take um, your electronic waste to somewhere that can recycle it. And there are places you can take your hazardous waste to, your electronic waste to, where it will be recycled. Has- otherwise, Sorry? How does the planned obsolescence fit into all this? Because like all of our companies are basically designing all of our electronics to last us a couple of years. Yes. And then, so like okay, you so have to have buy-in by. Yes. Industry. Planned obsolescence is unfortunately the opposite of what we'd like to have developed, which is as like a cyclical economy where raw materials are gathered up recycled and reused so that there's less mining or less use of raw materials, which takes much more energy as well. I think what will probably happen is when these materials become scarce or very expensive and it becomes cheaper to harvest these materials from electronic waste and recycle it than it does to just get rid of the waste, that's when we'll start seeing a lot of progress. But yes, you're quite right. That's what the EPA it says uh, it wants people to look at rather than, you know, looking at um, just a safe disposal or, you know, it wants people to look at recycling and look at the cyclical treatment of raw materials. Does that answer your question? It does. It's just sad. It is sad. <laughs> it is sad. Yes, it's